welcome. I'm Jeff Carter. I go by he, him with Seattle City Club. Welcome to this virtual civic boot camp on Native American leadership in the Salish Sea region and our third and final webinar on weaving social responsibility with Native values. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that Seattle City Club is a small nonprofit with a big mission to strengthen our community through conversations with community leaders on critical topics like this one and encourage civic engagement. So please consider supporting us to continue our programming like this uh, by making a donation on our website, seattlecityclub.org. And finally, uh, we at Seattle City Club value healthy dialogue and want to provide a safe and welcoming space for all to contribute. In order to do this, we have established community standards for webinar communications, and we will not tolerate threats of violence, profanity, or hate speech. Those who violate our standards will lose the privilege of attending this webinar. So with that, I'd like to welcome our moderator, Tamaris Lane, Indian Country Team Lead with Pyramid Communications. Thank Greetings, you, Tamaris. Thank you. It's so nice to be here with each and every one of you today. Nansiam and Nachalachasiam, Khalitia, Tamaris Lane, Senesnat. Welcome, good day, everybody. I come in a good way from the Lummi Nation. As I reside here on Duwamish territory, um, it's important to acknowledge the ancestors who have come before us. Um, and looking forward to the future in the next seven generations. Uh, as I would like each of you to think about uh, where you are located at the moment. Um, currently, I am here, as I said, on Duwamish territory um, at the intersection of multiple Coast Salish tribes, Suquamish, Muckleshoot, Snoqualmie, Tulalip, and countless other Coast Salish tribes have traveled these waters and continue to travel these waters uh, for millennia and generation. Um, it's important that in recognizing and engaging with the land that you're on, that there is a responsibility and an accountability to where you reside and to where you benefit from. Um, with that, I would like to point you all to the resource guide that was sent to you for the Civic Boot Camp. Native American leadership in the Salish Sea region. Um, this you can find the series topic speakers. Of course, this is the third in a three part series. If you haven't watched the other webinars, they're available online. They're fantastic. I recommend you do so. And there are also opportunities for you to engage with the urban Indian community as well as the local tribes. Um, I think as we approach Juneteenth, this is an important time to think about reparations, not only for our black brothers and sisters, um, but also for the indigenous communities who have resided here, who have been displaced um, and who continue to be valuable uh, to our local community. With that, we'll get right into it. I would like to have each one of our speakers, Alyssa Macy, Polly Olson and Bill Kalapa, did I say that correctly, Bill? Um, introduce themselves. We'll start with um, we'll start with you, Bill. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to be here today and and share some things with you and learn some things uh, from others as well. So this is exciting for me. My name is William Swan Kalapa II. Uh, I'm an enrolled Macaw tribal member from Nia Bay, Washington. Uh, my father is William Swan Kalapa. My mother is Colleen K. Uh, Kalapa. Her maiden name is Campbell. Um, and my uh, grandfather's James Kalapa, he's Macaw. My grandmother uh, was um, Josephine Dan from the Swinomish tribe. And then my grandfather on my mother's side is Keith Campbell. Uh, and Lena Campbell is my grandmother from that side and they're Scotch, Irish and English. So I'm, I'm of mixed race. So I'm glad to be, be here with you today. I represent Nisqually, the Nisqually tribe. I'm an education liaison for them. So I do everything early childhood, K through 12 and a higher ed for the Nisqually tribe. And I'm also a member of the State Board of Education. So I'm the first Native American adult to serve on our State Board of Education. So that's exciting. We have had one student. So glad to be here today. Thank you very much, Bill. I think um, one thing you'll notice is that we have a lot of first, a lot of leaders on this panel when we're talking about a weaving social responsibility with Native values. So Bill, we'll be coming back to you more about your experience and the values that you bring to education. Um, Polly, would you please introduce yourself? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's, I'm happy to be here with you. I'm Polly Olson. I am a member of Yakima Nation located in South Central Washington State. 
I currently serve as the uh, tribal liaison for the Burke Museum, Washington State's Museum of Natural History and Culture. And as said by, by Bill, I am the first. We are a 136 year old uh, museum and I am the first that's really um, uh, upfront and visible in making sure that we are bringing our native values and communities to, to the world. Um, my parents, my mom, I'm a mixed race as well. My mom was is Yakima. I also come from uh, the Cowlitz tribe. Uh, my great great grandmother married in, and my father is of European descent. I'm really happy to see you today. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. And continuing on with the first uh, Native person in a powerful leadership role, Alyssa, will you please introduce yourself? It's Ukti Wigwa. Uh, good afternoon, my name's Alyssa Macy, and I'm a citizen of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, Oregon. I'm of the Wasco, Navajo, and Hopi descent. Uh, somebody recently asked me how that happened, and I shared with them that my parents met through the American Indian Movement. So uh, the North and South came together, and here I am. Uh, I'm the CEO of Washington Environmental Council and Washington Conservation Voters. Collectively, these organizations have 80 plus years of doing environmental work and advocacy in the state of Washington. And I am the first person of color to lead this organization. Well, we are in terrific company and it's an honor to be here with each and every one of you. Um, my hope for everyone today is that we understand that in weaving together our stories, um, that we we all we each all only speak for ourselves and the organizations that we uh, represent, um, but we certainly don't speak for other Native people. And the idea here is to understand that there's a multiple um, different experiences and perspectives um, in our Indigenous community. So that being said, um, we'll just dive right into some of the questions. And and this one I'd like for you to to give as brief as an answer as you can, because we have more specific ones to get into. Um, for each of you, starting with you, Alyssa, uh, why is it important for non-Native people uh, to learn about tribal history, people, culture, and values? It is so important for non-Native folks to learn about the original stewards of this land you know, tribal people have been stewarding the lands, territories, and resources in this region, in this country, on this continent, on this planet, since time immemorial. And there is a tremendous amount of indigenous wisdom and traditional knowledge that will and is helping to answer some of the most complex environmental challenges that we are currently facing. It is also important because we have been largely invisible and that being invisible has impacted us in, in really negative ways, in stereotypes, in our treatment in the communities, in racist behaviors towards us. And you know, we are human like all of you. Um, we care about many of the same things as non-Indian folks. And there's such um, important uh, work that we can do together when we find those common things that we care about and love and choose to move forward um, in community to to make good changes. So I, I feel like, you know, we we have a lot to learn um, from one another and we have a lot of important work that needs to be done right now today to address a lot of things that are impacting all of us. And, you know, in my work, we're talking about the environment, um, but there are many, many areas that that need to be addressed. And we start by learning about one another and, and building and being in community. Thanks, Alyssa. Polly. Why is it important for non-Native people to learn about our tribal history, culture, and values? Because we're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we're awesome. I think, I think what's important in my work and role is that we are scientists and we have not been recognized as um, official, we have not been validated as scientists. And so through our work, we are able to bring those voices to the table, bring our indigenous ways of knowing and challenge Western science practices as one voice and narrative to a, a collective voice of, of education and solution pro problem solvers with, with the issues that we're looking at in the world. I think another thing that Alyssa referred to that I, I also feel is important is changing the narrative. 
um, the books are written by a, by a non-native person that writes about our history. There were language barriers, there were, were assumptions about cultures and they, they weren't clarified. And so we need to correct that narrative. And by engaging in these conversations, we're able to strengthen and enhance our relationships with society and, and come to the table on the things Alyssa shared. Thank you. Bill, the same for you. Yeah, for me, it's for me, it's um, it's important for non-native people to learn about uh, our indigenous communities because it's an opportunity to do so, right? And if we're not doing that, it's a missed opportunity, I think. Um, in Washington State, we're fortunate that we have access to 29 federally recognized tribes and some tribes that are not federally recognized and, and working toward that. But just the chance to interact with tribes, we have that in our state, and you don't find that all over the United States. There are states where you'll never bump into a Native American at all, not at the grocery store, not at a movie theater, nowhere. Um, so, you know, it's just we have access to these tribes and we should be learning from them. Um, you know, we have the Sense Time and Memorial curriculum in our state, which is great. So students in, in our state can learn about their lo local tribes. Um, and so we're, we're getting better with that. But um, to me, it's just, you know, to learn about our treaties and our laws and our, our sovereignty. Um, people learn a lot through that. Um, and it's overall, it's just enriching when you share music, when you share art, when you share um, dance and food with people, um, you're going to learn together and learn to love together. So uh, for me, it's about the opportunity. Why, why wouldn't you do that? Completely. The opportunity to connect, to make visible, um, to uh, to recognize and participate in our awesomeness, as you said, Polly. Polly, I wanna ask you this next question. Um, in your experience, uh, as you had mentioned, almost a few hundred years in the institution of, of the mu a museum institution and the, the mistreatment and violence that have happened to native people and the colonial legacy. Um, what are the main challenges that, uh, that you've uh, faced uh, and that your organization and its institution has faced when trying to incorporate native wisdoms and values? That's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, as the first tribal liaison, I think the number one challenge is teaching our staff how to work with a tribal liaison. What are the opportunities? What, you know, what are the, the unknowns? We don't know what we don't know. And there's a lot of that. And so um, trying to educate and create um, authentic conversations, uh, be creative in the conversations, especially in the natural history side of the museum, the biologies and, you know, paleontology and, and the natural science side. Um, they are opening to understand that we, we have relate, we should have relationships with tribes, you know, with the work that's being done in, in, in their research and, and work. I think another um, challenge is, is the diversity of tribal relations and being able to sit in a place, um, <laughs> to sit neutral, but still be honoring my tribal knowledge and my tribal descendancy, but, but, but hold neutral space so that all of the voices at the table can be heard and that we can figure out problem solutions, uh, how to come together and support uh, the work that we're doing in the Burke Museum. Those are two big ones. Thank you, Polly. Yeah, yeah, challenging. And I um, just a, a quick follow up with that is what are some success stories? I know that you've been on a decolonial journey. Success stories is um, the deeper conversations we're having. I think the we have a Native American advisory board, so our advisory board is feeling valued. Their work is being valued, so our they feel respected. They feel included in the process. That's a huge success, and we we're growing. The other is is as I said internally, is people learning how to work with me, how to ask the questions, and how to be again just the creative aspect of of how to move forward, and and break through what Western education has also forced upon them in their you know in their in their faculty positions. So changing a little bit. Certainly. Al Alyssa, you, you spoke about um, visibility and as someone who has um, a diverse 
tribal identity. How has your tribal identity influenced the work that you do every day um, at WEC and WVC? How, how has that um, impacted the way that you have approached your leadership? You know, I work in the environmental community and I don't consider myself to be an environmentalist. What I, how I view the way that I walk in this world is really a woman who, a native woman who's walking, the, walking with the knowledge that I was given as a child, what I learned growing up in my tribal community, what I've learned from listening to other indigenous leaders, you know, here in uh, you know, this nation state and globally with the work that I've done um, on the international level. And it's, it's about this connection to, to the land. It's about um, our traditional teachings about how we interact with one another. It is about listening. Um, and, and I really think a lot about that when I think about the work that I do. You know, how do I show up? How am I taking care of myself? You know, how do I choose to interact with, with other people? Because in, our, in my community, I have seen examples of where that hasn't worked well and we are dealing with the legacy of colonization and genocide. And so in many ways, we are walking as, you know, uh, broken people. And that creates a lot of challenges in our own communities and impacts our ability to do really great work that really takes into account these amazing teachings that we've been given. So knowing that and listening to what's happening across Indian country about healing, about healing from genocide, about healing from boarding schools, about healing from the abuse that we've experienced, that is something that I take very, very seriously for me personally. And so in my work, I'm, you know, with, the, with my team and the folks I interact with, I'm always saying, how do we show up in this space? How are we healthy human beings? Uh, because how we show up will impact our ability to do anything. And as a historically white-led environmental organization, we have a lot of work to do about undoing racist behavior, undoing the harm that we are ensuring that we don't do harm in the future. And so what does that mean for the staff internally to take that journey and the board to take that journey? That's really difficult sort of personal work that we have to do. And it's, it's key and foundational to anything that we want to do in the future. So, you know, I, I feel like I'm in this really great time in my life where um, that is important and valued and something that I'm sort of actively moving towards in, in that healing journey. And, and I just really feel like I, maybe I wouldn't do that if I didn't see it happening at such great rates in Indian country, but I'm so inspired by young people, young tribal leadership, our elders who are pushing us in that direction to just walk the values and the teachings of our people and to be healthy people. And then everything else sort of builds on that foundation in the work that we're doing to ensure that we have a healthy planet for all of us. Cause we are not a part, something different or something outside of the environment. We are a part of this ecosystem. We are a part of mother nature and we are a part of making it better. And we are definitely a part of making it worse. And so I, I always tell people, I'm just, I'm just being the, the Indian kid um, that grew up on the res um, and, and I'm just walking those values that, that I was taught. It's so imp important to, to carry those forward into, into every deliberation, um, every, every step that we take. I think that's one thing that um, uh, a lot of, no matter your culture, a lot of the teachings that we get from our, our communities and our elders um, and the land, are to be accountable. And um, Bill, you've had the opportunity to sit with some of the most important of leaders and that's the youth. And uh, we are in a very interesting um, uh, and pivotal moment through this pandemic and, and racial awakening or reckoning, I should say. Um, what have you heard from the young leaders, the youth leadership, whether it be at Nisqually or other tribal youth organizations, um, as you think about education um, moving into the future? Well, what I'm hearing is they want, they want to be seen, they want to be heard, they want to be valued. 
right? Um, it's, a, it's a system that has largely just shoved aside Native students and other students of color as well. Um, so they just want to be seen, they want to be heard, uh, they want their heroes reflected uh, in the history that's being taught in our schools. They want a big push for ethnic studies to be done across the board in our K-12 system, not just the class you take. Um, we've been pushed at the state board to uh, to make um, ethnic studies a high school graduation requirement. So we're in the process of doing that within our existing framework that what we, what we can do statutorily to make that happen. Uh, but they want us to push to uh, embed if you will, ethnic studies throughout our entire K-12 system. So we're, we're on that train right now um, and we're in for a fight and we know that, but we're ready for it because it's too important not to do it, especially when our kids are telling us that this is what they want, right? We had one student say, our history should be both uh, a window and a mirror. I should be able to look in to see and understand other people's histories and, and how they got to where they are, but I should also see my, myself reflected in that history as well. So our students are really asking us and pushing us to do that. Um, and, you know, and, and my position on the board, I always wanna represent kids first. So that's how I do my decision-making as I'm, I'm thinking about the kids and their lives and their futures, not mine or what a board wants to be, you know, accomplish or, or what adults in the room wanna accomplish. I wanna push for kids, so. Thank you, Bill. I'm gonna stay with you and um, I just wanna set the tone here. Um, this is a, a difficult conversation to had to to have in regards to the uh, mass burials um, that we have that we've known as native people exist at both residential schools and boarding schools um, this is important to acknowledge and and to your point about um, walking in you know from history through the window. I, there was a saying that I heard um, in my studies, my, my master's in American Indian studies, um, and it's a Hawaiian proverb of sorts that says, we are walking forward into the past. And we are, and Polly, this is, I feel like the work that you do every day. Um, and you have the responsibility of caring for ancestors. Um, and uh, that sacred work. And it's also very challenging and often violent. And so I just want to acknowledge that we are talking about um, our children and we are talking about um, the, the multiple schools that have now found uh, the graves of 215. That's the first one that was found at Kamloops Indian Residential School, but we know that there's so many more. Um, and, the, and the question here is, um, how should, we know that that happened in Canada, how do you imagine or what should be the responsibility of education systems in the U.S. government now as we know um, that there's work that needs to be done, done more inquiry um, and re-examination of Indian boarding schools here? Well, first off, um, you know, how about just acknowledging it to begin with across the system? We need our U.S. government, our state government to apologize um, I believe uh, Canada did that a few years ago, you know, made some apologies to their native people. Um, but the news that came out about the mass graves is not news to us as indigenous people, right? That's not news. We've always known that. Um, so although it might be shocking to other people, it's kind of a, a sad part of our history that we just kind of know and understand. Um, but our governments and our, our, our education system needs to teach this stuff, right? I, I speak to a lot of different classes at, at the college level too. Um, and we, we talk about boarding schools and at one point in our nation's history, um, you know, we, we talked about mortality rates, right? And you talk about education, you talk about graduation rates and dropout rates and all these different measurements. But at one point we did talk about mortality rates and think about that for just a minute um, to actually sit down at an all staff, all staff school meeting and talk about you know, our mortality rate dropped from eight students last year to six. So that's, you know, that those are actual conversations that have happened. So when I speak to a lot of college students, they, you know, the big, the number one question I get is why didn't I learn this in high school or junior high? All right. So there's, there's a thirst, there's a hunger for people to have this knowledge and it's largely been hidden from them. Um, and that's partially why um, I decided to, you know, apply to be on the state board of education is to bring a lot of these histories to light. Um, you know, it, it is, it's a tough topic to talk about, um, you know, but, but it's real, it needs to happen. Our students need to know this. Our staff, there's a lot of staff that don't know a lot about it, right? They're, they're teaching our histories and they don't know this history. 
So that's the question we need to ask is why don't we um, talk about these things? And I think if, in the larger push for ethnic studies, you know, these types of histories need to be brought up and taught. Um, you know, it's happened to our, you know, we had Japanese Americans interned right here in our own state, not that long ago on a timeline. And there's other atrocities that our students need to learn about. Polly, I'd like to ask you um, just for your reflections on, on that um, uncovering, if you may, um, as you do a lot of the work with, um, with cultural uh, remains and ancestors' bones and other things that are found, um, what has been your reflection or experience um, since learning um, this, or I guess uncovering, because we already knew as Bill. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, I'm, I've been very impressed with, um, with the, my colleagues that I work with at the Burke Museum. They have been very diligent um, since the Native American Graves and Repatriation Act came into a federal became a federal policy. But they were they started that work before it was a federal policy, in building relationships and in going into into tribal consultation uh, with tribes around around ancestors, both material and human remains in order to um, start working on this healing process that really all the museums need to do. So, I mean, I think it was one of the reasons I was able to come and work and feel like I could help take them to the next level. I'm a liaison. We have experts that do that work, that repatriation. But I do find that, that what, what's also important in, in reflection is preparing and being available to our tribal communities that come into the museum. There is, um, there is an opportunity for us to create a cultural safety, spiritual safety, because we are healing, but still we're dealing with a lot of trauma. And so we, before, when you come in, we'll probably, you know, have a moment and, and we'll just prepare ourselves, we'll ground ourselves together and then and, and we'll introduce ourselves, you know, to the building and to the communities. And these are the cultural teachings that people haven't made that connection with. I think another important aspect that, that is really important is who's not at the table. And generally, we aren't at the table. And we aren't at the table, then people don't know how to repair the harm and start the reconciliation with tribal communities, both in, in the discussions about boarding schools, but also these other really big issues. And so I think it's time. I think we have amazing leaders around the nation and it's time for us to be at the table. So when you're looking around your table, who's not there? It's generally us. And now it's time for you to, to find us. We're out there. We're ready. Yeah, As sure. the young people, we need to mentor our young people to take our seats. Yeah, that's right. Truthfully. And uh, I, I heard somebody say um, at one of the healing ceremonies I attended at Daybreak Star um, that these young children, these children that um, lost their lives at, uh, at the hands of the church and state um, are pushing the truth to the surface. Alyssa, why is it important for our healing, for our collective healing, that this truth be uncovered and brought to the service? You know, I, I, it, it, when I learned about, when I got the news, I, I just remember feeling sick. Like my, my, my reaction to the news was feeling physically ill. And I thought immediately, you know, about the community of Kamloops and how devastating that must have felt to them you know, they've been carrying, carrying this, this knowledge that their children didn't come home and there was no closure. You know, they, they suspected, you know, probably what they knew what was, what was happening, but they couldn't prove it. There was no way to prove it. And there, even if they could, there was no power to address it during that time. So, you know, all that pain has been passed on from generation to generation. So not only are you losing your children, you're losing your access to places like Celilo Falls for Polly and I, our people, you know, the silencing of Celilo Falls, the silencing of the Snake River, the silencing of Kettle Falls, the silencing of places that are intricately tied to who we are as Native people. 
you know, we're losing these things. So we carry forward that trauma and it shows up in our day-to-day -day lives as, you know, the, I always call them the isms, you know, alcoholism and, and things like that. And, you know, we have to really uh, reconnect with who we are as Native people because our teachings are powerful. And um, you, if you are, if you slow down enough to, to be present, um, if you slow down enough to sort of listen and to feel and allow yourself to take all of the things in, the, the power of the planet, the power of your teachings, the power, you know, of being outside, of being in community, you, you feel it in a way that is unexplainable. And that feeling to me manifests in, you know, joy and happiness and, and love and all of those things that I think we we have an innate desire to, to want to be surrounded by, but we don't always know how to get there. And so I think this, this, these children, um, I think their spirits, you know, made sure that they were found. They've been calling us to them. There have been more uncoverings of uh, at, at residential schools, children that they're saying that they've discovered. So I feel like they're calling us to them. They want to go home. And now we as community, as, as Native people, and as, you know, allies and friends to our communities, we need to start this process of healing because that, what happened is so devastating, is so unethical, is so morally wrong, is a violation of our human rights, is a violation of who we are as people. So, you know, we, we bring these children home and then we take the next step to, to healing because our brokenness is what is impacting this planet. Our brokenness and our behavior and our detachment from Mother Earth is impacting the health of this planet. And if we want to survive, like bottom line, if we want to be around for seven more generations, we have to change. And, and I believe with all that I am that the most important work, the most revolutionary work we will ever do, the most helpful work to the movement, to the things that we love and care about is to work on yourself and to show up as a better person. Um, and so I think the healing part of it, this healing movement, you know, and, and I say this and, and I also acknowledge that I am in this journey myself and this is a lifelong journey. I didn't just one day wake up and think, well, I figured it out, I'm, I'm so healthy, here I go. No, this is a this is a journey where there are great days, there are joyous days and happy days, and then there are the days that I that I am hurting and feeling sad and I'm struggling. But it's that balance and it's that and it's that knowing that I'm headed in this direction and I do the work that I do with great love and um, and and love for the people that I get to work with because I work with amazing folks. Thank you, Alyssa. It's all really powerful. And I think um, as a new mother myself uh, and going to attend these healing ceremonies, um, particularly for the 215, but for the countless other children as well, um, uh, it hits you differently. Um, and so I, I would like to bring this to the present moment and remind folks that this is not, this isn't uh, that far, that isn't like a long history. Um, my uncles went to boarding school and my grandfather, they all went to Chamawa in Oregon. Um, Alyssa, Bill, Polly, do you have uh, relatives that went to boarding school? Um, if you do, yeah, Bill, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I was going to say yes, yeah. It's, a, you know, I don't speak my language, Macaw, because my grand my grandparents didn't teach it to their kids because they would be beaten if they spoke it. So that's why there's a loss of language there. And, you know, we're not the only ones across the board for everybody, but um, yes. It's the, it's the same, the same here. I don't, I don't know Chlami Kachasin because my grandmother, who I believe was a fluent speaker, um, was very quiet and reserved because of this. Um, so uh, Polly, Alyssa, you have relatives that if you feel like contributing or we can we can move on. I have a, a follow-up for you, Alyssa, as well. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, the boarding schools was accomplished its assimilation, right? And and but also created a lot of harm in families. And yes, my family has been impacted by boarding schools. And we are we Alyssa, you're right, we're on this journey and we're really having now 
within a family, within five generations, we are having the boarding school conversation. We're talking about the impact. We're talking about, you know, why we stand here today. And it's been, um, it's really, it's really hard, but I'm really proud of my families uh, for stepping up, leaning in, holding each other's hands as we stand with the ancestors when we're taking care of our, our cemeteries and our family members, you know, leaning in and being able to have that honest conversation now so that they can heal as well as us and our babies moving forward. Thank you. Certainly. Alyssa, um, Polly had mentioned uh, everyone having a seat at the table and in 2020, um, Washington Environmental Council elected you as their CEO. Um, and I am curious, you've shared some stories with me. I'm curious about ways in which environmental organizations like WAC, WVC um, can and have um, incorporated more diverse voices. If you have examples or stories you'd like to share, that would be um, awesome for our audience. Sure, thank you. Well, environmental organizations, conservation organizations um, have been historically led by people that don't look like me, especially the ones that have power and positionality. So it was um, actually quite a shock for, for the fact that I was even offered the job. I applied for it and thought to myself, there is no way they're gonna hire me. So let me just do this as an exercise of practicing filling out job applications and I'll move on. Uh, but here I am, and I stepped into this role in January of 2020, so right before the pandemic, I moved to Seattle from the Warm Springs Indian Reservation, where I had gone home for seven years, and I was in a totally new city and amongst um, new folks, but didn't come here without connections to tribal communities, because I've spent my whole career working with tribal communities in some way, shape, or form. Um, one of the things that um, I learned very quickly was you know, harm that's been done by environmental organizations because folks were not afraid to tell that to me, um, to share where they saw areas of growth for the organization. And in our materials, we talked about upholding tribal sovereignty. And I asked staff, what did that, what does that actually mean in a day-to-day, -day, you know, work plan? What does it mean to you to uphold tribal sovereignty? And I learned that we had, um, folks that have knowledge and we had some that didn't. So we didn't have, I think, a, a very clear understanding what tribal sovereignty is and what it looks like to, to actively uphold tribal sovereignty. Working with tribes is really about building relationships in my opinion, and that takes time. And sometimes in nonprofit communities, you know, we're operating with not enough people and not enough resources. So we don't necessarily look at building relationships as being important. And in this work, because we address environmental issues, we are working to develop environmental policies. We are talking about the lands and, this, and the territories and the resources of indigenous peoples that were here, whether they're federally recognized or not. We are talking about places that they care very deeply about spiritually and culturally. So it's really important for us as we go through that process to engage and have relationships with tribes to better understand what they care about. I will also add that it's really important for us to be listening to other communities. Um, and, and by that, I mean um, black led movements by the Latinx community where there are very, very clear connections between the Latinx community and indigenous identities that we have as indigenous peoples here within our experience in this country. So there's a lot of people that need to be at the table. And in our work, part of what we've been doing is expanding our conversations to include more voices, which I think is really important, tribes being one of them. This work is hard and it takes time. And if you are not familiar working with um, tribal communities, then this becomes you know, sort of a steep learning curve but it is worth the investment and it is worth understanding and figuring out how you bring a diverse um, voice. So um, an example, yeah, upholding tribal sovereignty. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, when we got into the legislative session, there were some bills that were moving through the legislative session where some groups had some differing, you know, sort of opinions about how to move forward. And the question that I kept asking was, what do we know about tribes? Who has had a conversation with tribes? 
What are they saying? Do they support this particular bill? Have we informed them of the position that we are working towards? Have they had an opportunity to provide input? And if they haven't, then we have an issue and we need to slow down and not so, maybe so much worry about you know, winning or you know, stopping the, the passage of a bill. We need to have the conversation and hear what they have to say. And so um, I think it, it is really about that listening and then sort of working with the entities that convene. So Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians is an entity that convenes. So convening and being in those spaces and having the conversations, that is really challenging work. Um, anyone who works with tribes knows getting tribes to agree on things is hard. Um, there are so many differing opinions. Um, there are lots of things to work through. So it's not an easy thing and it will never be perfect. And, and I wholly anticipate at some point um, we as an organization will disagree with the tribe, but what I'm hoping is that I'm in relationship enough with them to understand, you know, sort of their position, our position. And I think really when you're talking about policy and po politics, it's about, for me, understanding, you know, the lay of the land, the policies, and sometimes, you know, moving to a neutral position and staying out of the way is like the best thing that you can do. And so I always ask that question in coalition space that I'm in, are tribes at the table and are black led movements at the table? Not an intermediary, not a, we, we got the checkbox. Like I wanna see that leadership with me standing there, sitting there at the table, having these conversations because I think that's just, it's, it's a really important to me personally. And I think it's really important to the environmental movement to have a, a, a wider, more inclusive table uh, as we talk about the challenges that we're facing. Thank you, Alyssa. Make sure you're muted, please. Thank you. Um, I just want to follow up on uh, the aspect of relationships. And uh, Bill, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. On this, one. Um, this past year, we talked about uh, how challenging uh, it has been from the pandemic for Native communities, for Black communities, um, the racial reckoning with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and the death of George George Floyd, along with countless other, um, should still be alive at the hands of, of police. Um, it exposed long-standing, or has continued to expose, I should say, long-standing inequities and disparities in our society towards Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, how have you, how has your organization, and this will be for all of you, how has your organization responded uh, to one of the most challenging collective years uh, of our recent history? I'm sorry, was that directed at me, Tamaris? Yes, please, if you want to start, that would be great. Sorry, cool. I heard there's some, a mic, am I the only one that's here in the open mic oh if yeah I, I um if you can make sure you're muted do you want me to repeat that or Alyssa did you hear it do you I think to... I think I got it it was about you know, kind of the response to this last year totally that's right yeah well on the education side and we as people of color right the BIPOC community <clears throat> have known this but the system wasn't working so well right for us um our K-12 system does a really good job uh, of graduating at a high rate kind of privileged white kids, right? And, and people with a lot of money. Um, so it's really shown a spotlight on, on those um, discrepancies and the disproportionality uh, of our students' um, academic learning access to just, you know, computers, right? And internet, um, that was the big problem early on in the pandemic. A lot of poor students, a lot of rural students, a lot of tribal students, a lot of uh, inner city students of color didn't have these uh, access to computers. And so, you know, we had to really scramble to get on that to make sure the kids had access. So it just really shone a, a bright light on how the system's not working. So, um, and how we need to make changes across the board. And so we're, we're working on that. We're trying to, you know, like I said, we, at the state board, um, you know, we working, we're working on mastery-based learning uh, around credits and what that looks like as a model versus grades. We know that, um, you know, our, our, our kids are going through a lot of anxiety, especially in the middle and high school level around grades and um, the 24 credits is stressful for them. So we're, you know, that, that might take some legislative change, um, but I think we need to, 
you know, um, re-examine the 24 credits because it's causing a lot of anxiety. Um, so there's, you know, we need to worry about the social and emotional health of our students, right? Especially with, with Native students, our topic today around historical trauma. Um, if you talk about adverse childhood experiences, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, that study, um, but there's like 10 criteria, right? <clears throat> for adverse childhood experiences. Um, but I would argue that there's, for Native people, there's 11 because we're born into historical trauma as Native kids, right? So there's 11 for us. And so um, it's really, um, you know, we need some system-wide change, but we're looking at that. We're looking at, again, like I talked about ethnic studies and instilling that, um, you know, just trying to change our system to raise better people uh, rather than raising better test takers. Thank you. And Polly, how has the Burke responded to uh, the pandemic and the BLM movement um, and racial reckoning um, that will continue? Um, it got messy it, and, and it got very emotional. And with the pandemic, we weren't able to have our critical um, conversations and to be present with each other as we were talking about the social injustices going on. Um, you know, working through Zoom, it was difficult to, um, as some of us say, to not get into oppression Olympics, you know, and when we're looking at the inclusion of and, and talking about the harm on communities and the, the harm on, on multiple ethnic groups and communities. So that was that was a very difficult task and, and coming together to, you know, do we speak out publicly, you know, externally, do we speak internally so that we can grow and continue to decolonize and, and authentically walk the walk of, of the work that we're doing. And also, um, you know, it was hard to work with, with the tribes because they were shut down. And so having access to the, to our tribal leaders and our tribal communities, they we were dealing with the really the whole world, but but the tribes were impacted. Um, but we I think I think we're coming out emotionally on the other end. I do know when we get together face to face, though, we will be diving into deeper conversations. We 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 want to be inclusive and we want to have some critical thinking going on about social justice and how to how to move to the healing aspect and that's what museums can be they can be a tool a resource for that if we if we can get everybody um not being defensive not being reactionary but being open to learning opening to listening and receiving the story of the experience and not trying to you know to one up each other in harm and, and hold space for us all to share that harm. And then love, love comes out. Love is revolution, as um, one of my dear friends and I say, love is revolution, friends. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. And, and Serena in the chat says, just because things are overdue does not mean it's too late to do something. And um, we agree wholeheartedly. Um, Alyssa. Uh, how has your organization responded? Um, I know that you talked uh, a lot about and lead from a place of, of tribal sovereignty. Um, can you speak to um, some of the responses in the ways that it showed up for your organization? Yeah, I just wanna sort of put an exclamation point by Polly's statement that it was hard. Um, you know, we at WEC and WCV are, you know, we are in relation with some organizations, but not a lot of black led organizations, not direct relationships. And following the death of George Floyd, you know, we had a lot of young, our young staff that were pushing for us to do solidarity work and the solidarity work and the issues that, you know, BLM and others were working on were not traditional environmental issues. So we started talking about police accountability. We started talking about, you know, um, funding for police. And that really made people uncomfortable because it wasn't sort of in our lane. 
but there's also been this conversation underway at the organization for a long time before I came on about are we an environmental organization or are we an environmental justice organization? Because when you look at the, you know, at the world's, you know, it, through the environmental justice framework, then you start to see why, you know, housing matters and why police accountability matters and why access to good education matters. You know, it gives you, um, you know, sort of that framework to see the bigger picture. So internally, we struggled. What, you know, what does solidarity mean? How far out of our, you know, sort of usual work um, are we going to go? You know, what is what was the work that you know I needed to do with the board, who in many cases were like, this is what we do, and this wider lane doesn't feel like who we are. Uh, but I think we're on this journey. And we've been in a strategic planning process, so we've had a lot of conversations about what we aspire to be and what we're working towards. And so I think we're, we are in a transition from, you know, sort of a traditional conservation organization to working towards being more wide thinking in, in, in an environmental justice framework. It also, I think for us, just really was this challenge about how do we work and be in relationship. And we did a really great job, in my opinion, of you know sitting in the space with Black organizations that were working on uh, police accountability issues. And that work um, was amplified through our channels. We were sharing things that we were receiving from groups. And it was really, again, not your traditional sort of environmental communications work um, that you would be, expect from us. So it kind of blew some minds because they were like, how is this happening? We worked together during the legislative session um, with uh, BLM uh, movements and coming out of the legislative session and looking towards the future. The question that I'm always asking um, internally, our team is what kind of relationship do we have with partners? You know, are we in a relationship with them? Because if we're in a relationship with an organization and with people, when we get to the tension points, the things that are hard, uh, we should be able to work through them. And we learned in the last legislative session that we are acquaintances with organizations. We are not friends. We have a lot of acquaintances. So like a mile wide, an inch deep. Um, we need to be an inch wide and a mile deep when we are talking about really transformative work, because the transformative work is predicated on, on your relationship and your ability to navigate through that. So our conversations and the work we're doing today with Black-led movements is really about digging deep, putting words around our relationship. What does it actually mean? What are we committed to? What are our values? And, and I think the big thing that we don't talk enough about in the nonprofit community and, and this work we do in partnership is about resources. Um, and I recognize in, in, in an institution that I work in, the access that I have to uh, resources to support these type of things is, is, is huge. You know, this is 80 years, 80 plus years of work. So you, you know a lot of people. As I do my work in the state of Washington, there's somebody who has either worked for us, been on our board, did something with the organizations. And so that's, a, I think, a responsibility that I have as a woman of color to, to make sure that when I have conversations about resources that I'm saying, you know, yes, please support our work. And I believe you should be supporting these other communities work. It's an abundance framework that I look through. Um, it is, it's hard, I'll be honest, it's hard because we're taught when we raise money um, that, you know, you hold those relationships really, really tight. And I think that has been sort of this teaching, which has, you know, we've internalized in many ways that has prevented resources from going into other communities. So it's always yes and, and also what does it mean to be in relationship? And let's have the conversation about what you need to do your work well, so that as I'm out in the community and I'm talking to donors and funders, that I can say yes and, here's this other organization. So it's a lot, of, I, I feel like um, I'm excited about it. And I will tell you Black Lives Matter has, uh, the Washington Alliance for Black Lives Matter has been a really key partner in the work that we are doing around the Lower Snake River Dam work, a key partner in that work, like standing with us and standing with us in a way that has resulted in some important advancement of this issue. So I look at this as, 
uh, as a we, that our liberation is intertwined together, that we need to find the ways in which we can support one another's work because if we can lift up our people, my people and the black community, everybody benefits from that. And the people that I'm not seeing at the table look like me and are often coming from the black community. So it is a, a core sort of value. It's a thing that I really care about deeply. And I'm bringing that to this work and it is not easy by any stretch of the measure. Boy, it's tough, um, but I'm committed. Wow, that's really powerful. Um, I think there were some uh, reflections in the chat um, and just reiterating, um, you know, an, an inch wide and a mile deep as being such a powerful statement and, and thinking, thinking about the breadth of our, of our impact. Um, you talked about relationships, Alyssa. I'm going to start with you. We have about five minutes left and then we'll get to some questions. Um, what values do you, I'm, and I want you to think of this in the context of what is native work? Like the work we do at home is very different than the work we do in our organizations. We're talking about ceremonial work. We're talking about uh, uh, work around death ceremonies, around healing ceremonies. So I would like for each of you, and Alyssa, starting with you, of what ancestral values, what values did your grandparents teach you that you carry into the work that you get to do every day and support your community? And for those that are listening, um, how, how they can maybe learn from those, how can non-Native people, allies, learn from those values and support Native communities? Yeah, I think, I think about, about my, my, my father the most when I hear this question, and my grandfather, grandfather my grandfather. Um, they, they always search to be outside. outside. Hey, Alyssa, can you turn your, can you mute your speaker and then unmute it again? It got a little. I have a robot voice. You have a robot <laughs> voice. Uh, that's 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 okay, uh, Polly, how about you? How, how do we bring our native culture to, the, to our work? Well, as you said, the ancestors are with us each day. And so as you do the work in, in as you do your work, I find that they give, me, they give me guidance. And so bringing those ceremonial, creating ceremonial spaces in the museum and teaching people about our lived culture, again, changing the narrative from othering or a past narrative to uh, this, you are invited to participate with me in this, in this ceremony. You are invited to share this story and learn this story with me. And, and once we do that work and we do it in a good way, the energy shifts, you can feel the healing, you can feel the joy and the, the, the relationship develop and, and grow into a bigger way. Um, it also takes creativity, especially with the intertribal interactions that we have to make sure that that each of the areas are represented, that we have people from the land we stand on to make sure that the spiritual ancestors are connected. And so creativity, but be careful of harm. Some, I've, I've made a few mistakes with good intentions. And, and just remember, we're, we're coming in and bringing that with good intentions because we haven't been invited to do this. I will pause there. Thank you. Excellent. And, and for those non-Native people, people and allies listening and organizations, tracking for vulnerability, having good intention is important, but also thinking through the impact of, to your point, Polly. Um, Bill, what would you say value, what values um, you can offer? Well, the first thing I can think of is, you know, I was taught by my grandparents to live a life of service to others, right? If you live a life of service to others, you're always going to be happy because that's great work that you're doing, whatever field it is. Um, another example would be how I bring culture to work to the State Board of Education. Um, when we have people that, you know, serve their four year terms or they're there for two terms, eight years and then they leave, um, you know, they would get them a gift. And so I, I brought up the suggestion of giving them a blanket and doing a blanketing ceremony for those that have left the board. Um, and that's a part of what we do now. And, it, you know, it's, it's not all out like a, in a tribal community where there's not drummers and dancers. It's not that whole thing, but it's enough culture in there to let them know the value of this ceremony and what it means. 
uh, and to thank people for giving service to the state board on behalf of our students across our state, right? It's one way to recognize the work that they've done. And every time we do it, there's not a dry eye in the room. It's, it's, it's that meaningful to them. And so I feel like I brought a little bit of our culture into the state board and, and they have a, a better understanding of, of what that means, that what those types of ceremonies mean to us. Um, the other thing I, I think that, you know, being building relationships within a state board, we were able to uh, make sure that we had a government to government training for the state board because they had never had one before. Uh, we had it scheduled for April of last year when COVID hit. So we, we haven't got to it yet, but it's, um, it's, it's on our horizon to, to do that government to government training because as a state board of education, they need to have that background knowledge of how do you interact on a government to government basis with sovereign nations. And so those are kind of, kinds of uh, how I bring culture into my work. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Alyssa, shall we try one more time? Um, Sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, my father and my maternal grandfather instilled in me a love with the outdoors. And I, at a young age, my dad was always telling me everything has a spirit. And he was, you know, I always call him a, a little bit of a jokester. So he would joke about everything. And I think that was his way of teaching me. My grandfather was also one that would scoop me out of his little cabin and go play outside and go talk to the plants and go, and he would make kind of jokingly say those things. And it really didn't sort of land on me that what this teaching was. And as I got older and talking with other, you know, folks in my community and relatives, um, they were always encouraging me to slow down because I spent my whole life just sort of operating on, you know, high, high sort of movement and just constantly going. And they were always telling me you need to slow down and listen and feel. Go outside, slow down, listen and feel. And I'm very, um, very intentional about that. And folks that I'm connected to on social media say you spend all your time outside hiking, and I'm, I'm like literally do um, spend a lot of time. But in that space, I'm you know I'm thinking a lot about uh, you know being in prayer, um, being in relationship, listening and feeling because you can feel it. And, and to me, that's the sort of this whole conversation in the environmental community, sort of the majority conversation is we have disconnected ourselves from nature. We have disconnected ourselves from the planet and the ecosystem. We have tried to control it instead of trying to be in harmony with it. And that is why we are where we are in a climate crisis at this very moment. So in order for us to really address that, we need to, to, to reconnect. And so I encourage folks you know, recreate, recreate responsibly, you know, know where you're at, know whose land that you are on, be respectful and know that everything does have a spirit. So how you treat it, you know, is, is, I think sort of comes back to you. I mean, people may call it karma. Um, I think, I think that's so true, um, karma. And so I'm always, you know, as I move in the world and especially in the, in the world of nature, you know, how I treat water, how I'm respectful to the resource, you know, how I'm not wasting it, um, how I'm outside in, you know, you know, as I'm hiking and being in place, how I am interacting with that is really important because you, when you slow down enough, when you quiet your mind, um, however you may do that through prayer or through meditation, you will start to hear those messages and feel those messages. And I continue to have these moments um, these really powerful moments um, when I'm out alone, just quiet and thinking and being in that space that, you know, kind of just um, bring me to my knees in a way that I can't really explain, but I know that is the spirit of, of you know, the life that's around me that I'm feeling. And, and that is worth fighting for, um, for all of us. The work that I'm doing, I think is just really, again, walking the values that I was taught and, and working to ensure that we, we have a future. You know, you mentioned at the beginning, seven generations. I want there to be a future for that seventh generation. And that means that today, right now, we need to be bold um, in what we're doing to address the climate crisis. Because if we're not, that may not be a reality. Certainly. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Polly. Um, I would like to just reflect the um, importance of uh, racial justice as environmental justice. 
um, education was never made for native people to, um, to flourish. Uh, and so we need to rethink our systems. The museum was certainly not made for a native leader, a tribal liaison and native voices. It was meant to put native people and our artifacts on display. So we are at a pivotal moment where things are changing. You are looking at um, this terrific panel of firsts Remember folks, this is first in each of their positions at these large organizations um, uh, that have impact, that will impact policy and change. In the black community, there's a lot of conversation around reparations. Um, in the native community, it's about uh, respecting tribal sovereignty and land back. Um, I think those two go hand in hand. Um, and why land back? Because in that way, we can return to our uh, we can return to our land, our teachings, and um, the the rightful belonging that and accountability that we have, and that we can collectively share. Um, so that's that's my final thought. Um, I'll pass it to Polly. Final thought. Um, look around the table. Who's not there? And also um, look at other ways of doing science, accept science as citizen science, as native indigenous ways, as, as all of us have scientific knowledge and that it's valuable. Thank you. Alyssa? Slow down, slow down. We, we miss out on so much of what I think um, our ancestors are trying to teach us because we move too fast. We, we don't take the time to just slow down. So I encourage you to do that. Um, it allows you uh, to receive those messages in a way that you, you can't unless you choose to do that. And, and those teachings, we all have them. We all have ancestral teachings. So, you know, being present and being able to receive those is really important. And, and you know, we say do all things with love. Bill. Yeah, I'm going to steal from Melissa a little bit and talk about <laughs> and close with relationships. Relationships and education, I said this in our breakout group, is, you know, as an educator, it's 90% of, of what I'm trying to accomplish is the relationship piece with a student or an athlete or whatever the situation is. 10% is content, right? So if we have, if we, that relationship is established, the learning is going to be better, it's going to be more meaningful, it's going to be more long lasting for the student. Um, and not only that, but with government to government is so important, right, with, with our local school districts. So an example would be the relationship between the Nisqually tribe and the North Thurston School District has improved so much so over the last 15, 20 years or so um, that they meet biannually, the North Thurston School Board and the Nisqually uh, Tribal Council, which is, I think, a rare thing that happens in our state. Um, but not only that, um, you know, the Nisqually tribe does professional development for staff at the North Thurston School District. Um, and the North Thurston School District now flies the Nisqually Tribal flag at all 22 of its buildings uh, in the North Thurston School District. So when our students enter those buildings, again, we talked about it earlier, they see themselves reflected uh, in the building that they're entering and then know that they're going to be cared for while they're there and that they're want, they, they are wanted there, right? And they're loved while they're there. So that relationships piece for me is so important, whatever work we do moving forward. So thank you again for allowing me to be here today. I would like to put my hands up to the Seattle City Club. Thank you for this opportunity to have this conversation and discussion. And my relations here, Alyssa, Bill, Polly, I hold you each uh, very dear. I'll turn it over to Jeff. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Timris, for your wonderful moderating. Thank you, Polly and Alyssa, for joining us and your, all of your gener generosity um, of time and sharing your perspectives and insights. Really appreciate that. Um, and I'm sure all the participants do too. I have to I give one more final thank, thank you to Alaska Airlines, our Civic Bootcamp sponsor who helped make this possible. So um, thank you all again, and I hope you get to enjoy this wonderful weather. Um, take care and stay safe. Mm -hmm.